lift a hand to heaven if you're comfortable with it. Right now, Father, I thank you that we tune our ear to your command. At every campus, right now, we say we want to be taught of you. Not taught of the world, but taught of the word of the living God. So we come here to hear your voice. Lord, let the voice behind the voice speak up. We say the still, small voice comes and it comforts, comes and it leads, comes and it heals, comes and it restores. Lord, we look to you because it's you that restore our soul. Now I pray you restore every family, every marriage, every relationship. Lord, I thank you that you fix the cracks in us and in the world. In Jesus' mighty name, we thank you for it. By faith, in advance right now, believing that we receive it. In Jesus' mighty name. Come on, let's give him one more hand clap if you believe he's done it. I believe he's going to do it today. Something good's going to happen to you. Come on, turn to your neighbor just tell them something good is going to happen to you today. Amen? Some of you don't even feel like it's a good time to be here. You were on your way to church this morning and everything went wrong. How many of you ever had an argument with your family on the way to church? Oh, come Anybody? on. Anybody? No, nobody had that happen this morning, I'm sure. But whenever we're talking about marriage, we're talking about family, it's like the devil's working overtime to keep people out of the house of God. And he wants you to feel like you're not good enough to come into the house of God. He wants to feel like you're not doing a good enough job parenting to even sit in the seats. He wants you to feel like you need to be ashamed so that your ears will shut off. But I just want you to shake off that shame, shake off that thing, and let God come right now and begin to teach you. Listen, I'm telling you what, Brian is so hard to get along with on Sunday mornings, but I just push through. And uh, God does a, a work on the inside of us. I'm teasing, but we, I, we, No, listen, we parent three children. We are married. We live in a real world where real people have to make real meals and go to real jobs. And we understand. And guess what? God chose you in your normalcy to to celebrate him and to be an example of him in this life. And he is not mistaken. He did not make a mistake. You are the perfect person for the job. So I just want to encourage you this morning, shake off all of that stuff and come in knowing that God wants to strengthen you this morning. Some of you feel like, I know you want to talk, but I I'm not done. I want to say something. I, and some of you, uh, you. Can I talk, please? <laughs> no, ahead. I'm playing. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, some of you feel like you've got a PhD in this thing. I mean, you've been married so long, you're like, I have forgotten more than you know, and you're just like, I can't learn anything today. I'm done. Some of you feel like you're drinking from a water hose. Everything that we give, you're like, I've never heard this before. I don't know what this is. It's like me and Brian trying to play soccer. We don't know anything about soccer. Like, we don't know any of the rules, okay? Some of you don't know any of the rules, and everything is brand new. And maybe you've been married 20 years, but it's all still brand new, and you've been messing it up for 20 years. Either way, I want to challenge you to grab one thing and take it into your Monday. Do not let the word of the Lord come before you and not grab at least one piece of wisdom and take it into Monday. So today, that's what we're looking for. We're not looking to learn everything. We're looking to learn something today and encourage our family and our marriage in particular because we're going to focus on marriage today. Amen. I'm so glad that you made it. Come on, turn to your neighbor. Just tell them you're lucky you got to set by me. Tell them that they're lucky. Y'all give all of our campuses a big hand clap right now. Everybody online. Come on. We're going to get better at marriage and family. And we survived the snowpocalypse. They did. And even if you fought like crackheads on an episode of Cops, thank God you're here today. You're in the right place. Amen. We're proud of you. Open up your Bibles if you have them on you today to Genesis chapter 2. All right? We're going to go right to the book of beginnings. We're going to focus on marriage. We've been doing relationship playbook for three weeks. If you have not uh, heard the series, you ought to go back and listen to the last couple. We were talking about the culture of your house, the culture of your family. And come on, we ought not just let our culture evolve naturally. We ought to focus on what we want in our house, what we want in our life, what we want in our family. Can I get an amen out there? Great things don't just happen. Great things must be built by strength strategy, and purpose. And really God's primary purpose to creating the earth that we live in, putting together this wonderful world that we're a part of, even though it's broken and cracked, the primary building block he uses to build his plan on the earth is the family. 
You can see it right here in the book of beginnings. What God does is God creates for six days, makes the heavens, makes the earth, makes the stars, makes the sun, makes the water, makes the fish, makes the cattle, makes everything but the cat. The devil made the cat. Can I get an amen out there? <laughs> made the dogs, but not the cats, right? He makes all of this other stuff. The cat came when the fall happened. But Some people makes, love cats. Yeah, and I love you. I love you. I just don't love your cat, all right? So, so he makes all of this stuff, and on the sixth day, he saves it to create the pinnacle of his creation, which is man. You are made in the image of God. Then the Bible says in the Hebrew, he roughs Adam up out of the dirt, roughs him out. Then he picks up Adam, this dirt-like puppet, if you will, doesn't have the breath of life in it yet, and he breathes into Adam the breath of life, and all of a sudden, Adam becomes a living being. What makes us different is we are made in the image of God. What makes us different is we have the breath of God on the inside of us. What makes you different, Christian, is you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're different than the monkeys. Come on, you're different than the dolphins. You're different than the dogs. You are different because you're made in that image. And the man is, is roughed out. And then he looks, he gives the man a job. He says, man, you're going to tend and keep the garden. Come on, it's not good for people not to have something to produce in yes. life. You stop producing, you start perishing. Let me say it again. If you stop producing, you start perishing. It's okay to retire, but you better find something else to do with your time. Because how many know the stats show if you stop producing, you start perishing. Right. So I think we just, you, you can quit one thing, but you ought to create something new. Uh, man's putting the garden to tend and to keep it. But then man's got a purpose. Man's walking with God. Man's in the garden. God looks down at man and says it is not good for the man to be alone. You could look at any of our bachelor pads before we got married, and you would say it is not good for the man to be alone. Can I get an amen out there, right? It's not good. His car's full of fast food trash, and his house is messed up, and nothing's on a hanger. <laughs> it is not good for the man to be alone. So God says, I'm going to create a helper suitable for him. So let me say this, and then we'll read our text. He takes a rib, and he finally handcrafts, the Bible says, in the original language, finally handcrafts Eve, roughs out the man, yeah. all right? Finally handcrafts the woman. Let me say it again. He roughs out the man in the Hebrew, finally handcrafts the woman. Let me say it again. He roughs out the man, and he finally handcrafts the woman. We have a culture now that wants to take away the fact that our men are designed to be roughed out of the dirt. We're not designed to be smooth. We're not designed to be like women. We're not designed to be effeminate. We are designed to be men. And this culture is killing manhood. And it's time that we stand back up and the boys act like boys and the girls act like girls. Yes. And the boys wrestle on the boys' side of the ring and the girls wrestle on the girls' side of the ring. Can I get an amen out amen. there? Amen. We are killing ourselves. I don't know if you figured it out yet or not, but we really don't care what anybody thinks about us. And I don't care. I am telling you what, the Bible is the Bible. Let the word be true and every man be Amen. a liar. And I, I, I want to I say this on the female side of the bowl, and, and I think this is important. Sometimes whenever you marry a woman... And she is finely handcrafted and she continues to perfect herself because women have a tendency to continue to perfect. We continue to pick things off of men. We continue to Thank iron you. things. We continue to try to perfect what is on our body. We like to be pretty. We like things, sparkly things. We Glittery things. I, I thought it was interesting that I had velvet on and so did Garvin this morning. But <laughs> Where's Garvin? Let's he, pick he on Garvin. He well, though. I'm not going to give it to him. Uh, he looked like, Brian said he looked like Elvis. But I, I, I'm telling you, girls, when, when we do that, and then men on the other end of that, sometimes we, they don't want to fund that endeavor. And to them, it seems like a waste for a woman to be finally. You trying to get some money out of me or what? I, I've already got your money, baby. <laughs> I got it all. Uh, I'm not trying to get any money out of him, but I'm just saying sometimes men, and, and if something's not important to one woman, that's fine, but something may be important. But it's very important that you allow your wife to beautify. 
to decorate, to design, to create, to because this is a part of the nature of woman. A lot of times we want to ignore that part of a woman because it can be expensive. It can also be bargain shopped, and all the bargain shoppers said amen. But sometimes we want to ignore the fact that that is a part of a woman that is placed inside of her heart by God and we enjoy beautifying things and there's nothing wrong with that and in fact I think the husbands that encourage it when I see a woman that looks like a flourishing garden I think wow what a wonderful husband she has when I look at a woman and she look, she's beautiful I think she's a beautiful woman but in the back of my mind I always think she has a husband that loves her that cares for her that takes time to to experience what it is that she enjoys. Brian's always been gracious to me in that way, and I appreciate it. And the best part was he didn't have any sisters, so I could tell him things cost anything, and he believed me. But i just telling you that it was one of those things in our marriage that we that we had we had to come to an agreement. Brian was going to be rough, and he was going to talk like a man, and he was going to be different than all the sisters I was raised with, and he was going to say things I didn't think he should say, and he was going to do things I didn't think he should do, and he just looked at me and say, "I'm a man," and I was going to perfect and beautify, and I was going to have that part of me, and he's always encouraged it, and he's always encouraged our daughters in that, and he loves every bit of that. Listen, encourage the God given things that God places on the inside of man you know, and woman. I knew we were in trouble as a culture. Me and Jesse went to the beach and all the guys' backs were shaved. And I'm out there in a fur coat and I'm like, God, we need to pray for America now. Pray for America now. <laughs> he said fur coat. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's so, awesome. That's so exactly it's just, it, what it is. It, it, it's like this. We say all that to say we... <laughs> This is fun. The AP is going to have a lot of fun with this. You're welcome, New York Times AP had fun, right wing, right wing watch. Um, all right, so so here's what it comes down to is we have roles for a reason. Yes. Can I get an amen out there? Say it again. We have roles for a reason. Can I get an amen? Amen. And it's not that I don't think women can cannot achieve and be whatever. I have two daughters. I pray they're the president of the United States of America because I'm going to ride on Air Force One. Yes. My, my wife is a public speaker. She travels the world without me, uh, goes wherever, does whatever, is ever been as competent of a speaker or better than me. I want her to succeed. But how me know I'm called to succeed succeed as a man in a masculine sense she's called to succeed as a woman Absolutely. in a feminine sense and you can have an empowered masculinity and you can have an empowered femininity and the two don't have to be against each other it is god's divine design yeah. stop fighting against it we are different can i get an amen we're different amen and that's why god takes us and puts us together in marriage all right so let's look uh genesis chapter 2 we're going to start reading in about verse 20. Let's go verse 20. And this is Adam who's actually helping God. God gave him the, the task of naming all of his creation. It says this. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper comparable to him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs uh, and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Everybody say one. One. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. They must have been eating keto is all I got to say about that, right? So, so here we have Adam and Eve are in the garden. Uh, Adam's in the garden and God looks down and says, it's not good to be alone. So what God does is he says, I'm going to make a helper or a help me comparable to Adam. Even though Adam had an assignment, it wasn't good enough. Even, even though Adam was walking with God, there was still something missing. Marriage is a gift given to us to, from God to give us a partner to do life with and to help us escape loneliness. Now, some people have a grace given to them to do life single, but they're the exception. They're not the majority. And, and even Paul talked about that grace. The majority of people, even when
when they're single, they are single and ready to mingle. They have the urge to merge, right? They, they, they're they looking for somebody to do life with. And that's all right. That is natural. If and, you need help, I actually provide a wonderful service. It's very expensive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Jesse's a matchmaker, <laughs> but it'll cost you. That's I tell what I Brian to say. all the time, I have a 10 out of 10 rating. That's not bad, but... She, he tells me to stay out I of it. I tell her not to hook him up because when it's bad, it's bad if you were involved. Can it's I never get an bad amen, if you're right? hooked up by Jesse. That's all I got all right, to say. All right. So, so anyway, <laughs> back to the Bible right now. <laughs> um, we, we, got, we, got, we got Adam. God opens up his side. So this, is the, this is the first thing. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down, all right? Hope we've said something worthwhile before then, but write this down, all right? The first thing is if you're going to have a good marriage... It will require sacrifice. Yeah. Adam has to bleed. Adam has to give. Adam gets knocked out cold. Come on, if you're going to have a good marriage, you're going to get knocked out cold a few times. Can I get an amen out there, right? It's the way it works. You have to sacrifice to have a good relationship. A lot of people think relationships are going to work on a take, 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 take basis. But relationships will not work on a take, 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 take basis. There has to be a give. There has to be a reciprocation. It's the way things are designed. And uh, what will feed you in life is what you feed. What you refuse to feed will stop feeding you. Mm -hmm. have an illustration about this. I got a dog named Pirate. And Pirate stays in the house with us. I love Pirate. He loves us. And if I make you, you're a made man. If I have not made you, Pirate will bite you. So just beware. If you come around my house, I have a biting dog, all right? So, so Pirate's there. And one night, Jesse and I were out in the middle of nowhere. It's like 2 in the morning. We're driving with the kids uh, across country. We run out of gas. I pull into a gas station. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting there in, in a car, and I'm trying to stay awake. You know where you're in that almost going to nod out driving kind of deal? I pulled over to get gas. Pirates in the back. The kids are in the back. All of a sudden, this dog jumps over the top of my head, and he hits the glass with his mouth open, and he's barking and screaming at the top of his lungs. And I don't know what's happened, but there was, a, 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 for lack of a better term, a crackhead. And I know you can't say that, but I can say that because I used to be a crackhead, so I get to say <laughs> that, right? A crackhead comes walking up on the side of my car and is wanting some money. And Pirate sees them, knows their danger, is not going to let them get near to me. Now, why did Pirate do that? Pirate started feeding me and protecting me because I've been feeding Pirate and protecting Pirate. Can I get an amen? Yeah. What you feed in life will feed you back. What you stop feeding will stop feeding you. It's true. And the crackhead's asking me for money, and I'm like, I'm on the Dave Ramsey plan, and my crackhead envelope's all empty. I can't <laughs> help you tonight. If I was going to give money to crackheads, let me know we got our own crackheads in our yes, family we, we give money to. Amen? Not your crackheads, right? So, uh, so anyway... Uh, you got to feed something, you got to sacrifice, you got to give something, or things disappear. Listen, sacrifice goes both ways. And a lot of times people enter into a marriage and they think, well, this person is just naturally more giving, they're more nurturing, they're more sacrificing. So I'll just let them do the sacrificing and I'll do the receiving. But what happens is we don't make enough investment and it steals the joy from our life because the Bible says the greatest of all is the servant of all. You can never be great in this kingdom life until you choose to lay something down and be the person that sacrifices. It should be a competition to see who gets to sacrifice first. It doesn't feel like that. I still remember whenever I had three children under the age of five, I was exhausted. I was sitting in a chair one day feeding my baby. And I remember that the other two were there asking me for things. I was so tired. I hadn't slept in so long. And I looked up and Brian had the audacity to make eyes at me. And I was trying to be... I turned on the Marvin Gaye album. It's <laughs> oh, it. But he was looking at me, and it was just that nobody else would have known that he made an eye at me, but I knew what he was asking for, and I didn't say a word, but apparently my face said it all because he looked shocked, and he went and he gathered all of the children, and he said, he grabbed the baby off of my body, and he said, come on, children, we're leaving now. You're coming with your father. And he ran out of the house... And I thought, what just happened? I, I don't even know what just happened, but I was, I was empty. I was 
completely without anything left to give. And I think what happened in America was that we took from women when we told them that it was not their job to ever sacrifice. When all of those bras were burned and we told women that they didn't have to do anything for anybody anymore, we took their sacrifice. We took their greatness. We took their joy because the Bible says that the greatest of all is the servant of all. So by stealing the servanthood through our vocabulary, through stealing the servant from our teaching and you don't know anyone, anything, and you teach people how to treat you and you're not there for a man ever and taking all of these things that aren't biblical, but have become mainly our mindset in the United States of America. We took something from women that belong to us. And as Christian women, I believe we should fight to get it back. I think we should say, you know what? I can have what everything God says I can have. I can do everything God says I can do. I can do business with the best of them. I can do politics with the best of them. I can preach with the best of them. I can be a doctor with the best of them. But you will not steal my servanthood. It is the joy of my soul. Something happens when we decide to walk out our life biblically. That sacrifice sometimes feels like just too much. Some of us are working full-time jobs and even more than some of you are working two full-time jobs. You have 77 children and a husband that only has one love language and it is serve me. (laughs) And I get that there is exhaustion and there is emptiness, but I heard words from a wise woman once when I was uh, a few years into young children parenting and it blessed my life. She said, Jesse, whatever you do during the day, give as much as you can give, help people, love people. I'm in the ministry. It's all I do all day long is help people, love people, uh, uh, counsel with people, do things for people, help them through the hardest parts of their life. She said, but when it comes down to put your kids in bed, bathe them, love them, feed them, go to their sporting events, do all that you can do. But at the end of the day, you reserve one hour of energy and you give it to your husband. And I thought, how in the world am I supposed to reserve one hour of energy? She said, you give it to your husband, whatever that looks like that day. Different seasons look different. Sometimes you can't do that every single day. But if it's our effort, I like to reserve an hour and a half of energy because an hour and a half means that I get 30 minutes to recharge Jesse, and then I can still give time to Brian. Sometimes that's 30 minutes for him, an hour for me. Sometimes that's 45 minutes for me, 45 minutes for him, whatever that looks like in your life right now. But if you'll just start with reserving 30 minutes, 15 minutes of your energy that you can give back into the most important relationship, that oneness that you have, whether you're a man or whether you're a woman, this can change the whole trajectory of your relationship and your marriage. You say, how do you reserve energy? Energy is one of your greatest assets. It's more important than money. You can get more money. You can't get more energy necessarily. You can't get a lot more time, but you can get, but you can reserve those things and know I'm about two hours away from conking out and never being able to talk to anybody again. I have to still cook dinner. So I'm going to do that, but I'm not going to call my sister-in-law who's exhausting and have a 45 minute conversation with her while I do it because then all that energy just got expended on something that is not pouring into the most important relationship in my life. As people of God, we have to know ourselves. We have to know our God. We have to know our boundaries. We have to know who we are in Christ, and we have to give ourselves to the primary things, the priorities. And if all of those things are put into the schedule first, the family, the children, the marriage, sometimes you'll hear Brian and I say, we have an appointment. And people will say, what is your appointment? I say, I have an appointment. What appointment do you have? I have an appointment. It's none of their business what my appointment is, right? Why? Because it's my job to do what God's asked me to do for my family and my life. So I have to do what God's asking me to do. But a lot of times that appointment is my appointment with Brian. 
A lot of times that appointment is my appointment with my oldest daughter because I promised her that I would be somewhere. A lot of times just because someone has an emergency doesn't mean that it's my emergency. Sometimes my, my son who, who's turning 11 today is in need of his mom to be at that event that he has and that is my appointment no matter what emergency comes up on the calendar you have the right to take control not be selfish but be prioritizing your life every single day and reserving the energy for the things that god has given you to do come on that's good yeah if you don't take control over your calendar, your calendar will eventually take control over you. It's Amen. True. So you got to take control. You got to make priorities. The most romantic Here, thing you ever did was put me on your calendar. A absolutely. Thank here's, you for that. You're, you're welcome. Here's what here's what it says. Genesis chapter two, verse twenty four. It says, "Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh." What a marriage should be is you've left behind everything else. It's not that you're not respecting your former life or your mother or father, but come on, you have a new family now. So this is yes. now one. There's no longer Brian and Jesse. There is one. We are one person. And after almost 21 years of marriage, we now think alike, talk alike. We communicate telepathically. <laughs> I know what she's going to be mad about what I did before I told her I did it on the way home. How many married people know what I'm talking about? You already know what she's going to say when you get there and what you're going to say in response and how it's all going to go down. You know what's coming, right? 21 years no, in, we are, we are one. Why do you do it? Uh, well, because I got to do it. It's I'm, I'm, I'm my own human too, right? We're one, but we're our own. So it's it's life. But but here's what we found. How do you stay one when the rest of the world's trying to pull you different ways? And we live in a world uh, where there's a lot of there's just a lot of demand. You know, I'm not I'm not like crying about it. I thank God for it. I prayed for this kind of life to come yeah. to me, that I would have, be able to minister, I'd be able to pastor, I'd be able to win souls, I'd be able to influence nationally. I prayed for all this stuff. And now I think, my Lord, what was I thinking when I was praying for all this? I should have been praying for a shade tree and a hammock. But, but you pray for this and it shows up. So now I have to find a way to protect what matters the most. Because all of this stuff on the outside, it's going to be here today. It probably won't be here in a decade, right? They, they might not want to interview me in 20 years. Come on, somebody. But I'm still going to be married to her. And this is going to matter more than all of that. So what am I going to do? And I haven't always balanced this uh, correctly because I'm, I'm by nature a workaholic. I'm the happiest when I'm working. I would rather work than do almost anything on earth except maybe one thing I can think of right now. Uh, we'll talk about that later in the marriage series, all right? So, so I, I'm just telling you, I love to work, and, and, but I had to come up. Jesse and I, we started working uh, years ago, planning churches together. We worked together. Uh, as soon as there, we were starting in Owensboro, and as soon as there was, uh, we, we didn't make a lot of money at all, but there was enough for both of us to work. I worked a full-time salary. She got a part-time salary. We worked every minute of every day. And I made the mistake, and I think this is a male mistake. Um, there's probably some females that make this mistake too, but I'll say it probably is a male mistake. I thought because we were together. I think it's a personality mistake. Maybe it's a personality mistake. I don't know. I thought because we were together. We got up in the morning. We made our coffee together, right? We, we, we got ready together. We went to work together. We had work lunches together. When we were done, we did small groups or whatever at night together. And I thought because we were together all the time that we were together. But how many know there's a difference between being together and being together? We say there's a difference between being together and being together. Amen? Some might talk about quantity time versus quality time. I didn't get it. And Jesse came to me once and said, listen, I, I, I'm with you all the time. I love you. I know you love me, but it's like I'm starved on the inside for affection, romance, and real connection. And so I repented for what I did. And we put together at that point in our life, every Thursday night was date night, every Thursday night. And even we taught in the church back then that on Thursday night, it's our date night. If you see us, leave us alone, right? Say hi, but leave us alone. We're not at the restaurant to talk to you right now. We're there to talk to one another. And I think a lot of times the busyness of life can eat up that time that keeps you one. 
I want to say, too, I'm a huge communicator, like too much communication sometimes. But that was one of the hardest conversations that I ever had to come up with to give him because I felt needy. And I don't like feeling needy. I'm very independent. I'm capable. And I didn't know what to do, but I knew something. I knew my heart was drifting away slowly from him. And I knew that the devil was going to take that foothold and cause a problem. So if you're constantly just nagging, 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 I need more, I need more, I need more, that's one thing. But for someone to come to you and say, hey, we need to have a conversation. I I really, this is what I need in order to go forward and respect, love, cherish, and have a relationship with you that's open. It's time to listen. And I'll give Brian brownie points on this because he actually listened and he didn't get offended with me and there had been many months that I had said it in different ways but he was doing other things and he would just get offended and brush me off and act like it was no big deal but whenever that happened I knew if we don't get a hold on this right now we are never going to make it through the busyness of life that I saw on the horizon and even since then we've taken times when we came and traveled back and forth back and forth for these last three years, it has been a stress and a strain on our relationship to get that time, to get that thing. Everybody wanting us to do this or wanting us to do this and really being kind and sweet and wanting us to do those things, but knowing that it's been three weeks since we've had a chance to actually communicate with each other without children listening to every word because our kids are that age yet. So we have had to, even in the last couple months, reprioritize what is the priority, what we're doing. So seasons change things happen we try every seven days to do to at least go on a lunch date we try every seven weeks to go away for a day and spend a day with each other we try for every seven months we go away for a weekend or a few days and we try really really hard once a year to go away for a full week and do that I don't know what season you're in. I don't know what kids you have. I don't know if you have parents that can watch those kids. I don't know if you have great babysitters. You know, but you know if you're giving your best to your spouse. That's really what it is. It's giving him the best. You know, Brian and I, years ago, we would preach every Sunday, and we took off on Monday, and our kids were at school, and we would try to spend Monday together. And we figured out really quickly that we were giving each other the worst day of our week. We were exhausted after Sunday. Sunday. We were grumpy after Sunday. We didn't want to talk, much less look at each other on Monday. And that was the preacher's day, hangover. We, day. Yeah, we had preacher hangover that day. And that day was the day that we were giving to each other. So we swapped it. And now we give each other Friday. Friday is a different kind of day. It's the, toward the end of the week, but it's before we get ready to ramp up again for game day is what we call Sunday. And so we began to try to invest the best day. Give your kids your best. If that that's your morning, have breakfast with them. If it's your night, get, have dinner with them. Give your spouse your best. If that's your Friday, if that's your Saturday, if that's your I don't know what it is. And do yourself a favor and give God your best. You know, everybody says you have that's to good. have an early morning prayer time where you spend an hour with God. You pray this many minutes in English. You pray this many minutes in tongues. You read your word for this many minutes every morning. Well, guess what? It might not be your best time. God doesn't like hearing from me in the morning. He likes hearing from Jesse in the evening because that's the time that I am the most able to focus on him. And so I talk to God at a different time of day than Brian does. You don't need to be put in a box by society. You need to be free in God to enjoy your relationships, to love each other, and to have the family that God's called you to have. Don't ever let that weight of religion get on you and ruin the joy of your salvation. I want to encourage you today. It's not worth it. It's not any way for Christians to live. Amen. Hey, the last part of the passage I read to you, it said this. It talks about Adam and Eve. It says they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. So these guys were in the garden, and, and they're naked. They have real intimacy. Obviously, they start bearing children. Now, I'll tell you, a big part of marriage is intimacy. It's sex. I'll say it like this. I know as a man, I can't speak for women. I've never been a woman, but I can say this. Men do not get married to have a sexless marriage. Neither do women. Let's say that again. Men do not get married to have a sexless (laughs) marriage. Neither do women. All right. 
Let's say that one more time. Men do not get married to have a sexless marriage. Neither do women. All right. So, so we've established something here. Uh, that is that, that, that sex is a wonderful pastime that costs no money. You may it's be totally free. <laughs> Someone may be terrible at it and they don't want it anymore, but they didn't originally get married. That, that, that's that. right. That's right. Uh, here's the deal. A, a sexless marriage is a ticking time bomb. And, and what's crazy is sometimes people in church, you bring this up. It's all over the Bible. The topic of sex is all over the Bible. Yeah. People get scared in church. Every time you open up that Instagram, you're going to see something sexualized. Every time you open up that Facebook, you're going to see that, that duck lip selfie, right, with the <laughs> angle right down the shirt. You know you see it, right? Yikes. They put it up everywhere. Every time you turn on the TV, you're going to see things sexualized. Our children, as young as first grade, in a lot of our school systems, are being taught that there are no such thing as gender and that sexual ethics don't matter anymore. So why would we allow the world to train our churches about sexual ethics and sexual identity and the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and the prophetic voice and the pastors remain quiet. It makes no sense. Sex is a massive part of life.